questions, comments? Any, any, any questions? No obligation when you've got time to it. Yes, sir. So, um, I know plenty of a few people that are involved with Ace of the Church in Need and the Latin Patriarchate out in the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. And I know they have a lot of stick from the Israelis when they try and get aid into Palestine. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could expand a bit on um, how you deal with hostile governments and how you try and get through anyway. Thank you. Nice question. I like it. Because we're doing it all the time. I mean, just for example, one of the times I came out from um, Nagorno-Karabakh and we went to the British Embassy in Armenia and um, they have the Azerbaijan newspapers and uh, she showed me this newspaper. Is that there? Is that there? Yes. Thank you. And, and it was Azerbaijan newspaper. And they had pages, and here's the suit across the top. Shoot the cops. And they said, you know, cops comes in illegally into our country. And then, it's quite funny, really. So the only reason she comes is to look after her heroin fields. Because it must be how she raises her money, the heroin fields. <laughs> and it's the only reason to go to Garabar. So maybe we had two botany skills on that trip, and I said, do you go and find my heroin fields, please? <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't found those yet. But they are very hostile. Um, Khartoum doesn't love me. I think Khartoum once gave me a, a prison sentence in, in absentia for illegal entry. I'm serving it um, in absentia too. So thank you, Madam Common. Very inclusive. Um, I like you. Um, <laughs> but um, it is tough. And um, and uh, I don't know, but most recently, and this is a very hot subject, and something which you may have seen quite nice to open up to discussion, but I just came back from Syria, they're bringing Syria into our portfolio. And I went on a pastoral visit, I've been there a few times actually, and um, being invited by His Holiness the Patriarch of the Syrian Orthodox Church. We also met the Grand Mufti, we went up to Aleppo, and we went to Church Eastern, and it had some heartbreak, heartbreak stories. But wherever we went, and this is a very good one, I've been now, Wherever we went, we heard, I mean, understandable, real anger at the firing of missiles onto Syria. You must have maybe followed that after the alleged chemical weapons attack. And I mean, I sit in Parliament at Um, A, it was no, it was illegal. Uh, the only legal justification for firing missiles is if that country is going to be a threat to you. And there was no mandate, it wasn't even a parliamentary mandate. And they fired those missiles the day before the chemical weapons investigators should have gone in. So, you know, I, mean, I understood their anger and I shared their concerns and have done that. I've written to the British government about it and so on. The British government don't love me at the moment. <laughs> and uh, it's very strange, some very hostile articles appeared in the papers. And we found that when we've been to places before where we're there into the British government, then sometimes there seemed to be quite a link up between aspects of the media and the British government. I don't know, I had the most unbelievably hostile interview on the Today programme. And I wanted to talk about the suffering people of Syria, and they are really suffering, as you could imagine. Um, a little way back, they had thought that there was a bit of peace on the horizon, because I, um, the Syrian army, together with Russia, and I think it's one place Russia doing the right thing, their priority is get rid of ISIS, get rid of the terrorists, get rid of the horrors that are perpetrated by ISIS. And they got ISIS out of about 90% of Syria. When I was there last time, there was a real feeling it could be hope coming. And then there was this alleged chemical weapons incident, and you know, there's no reason why I say it. I'm not an advocate for Assad. I don't condone the presidency he has done. But um, you know, there was no reason for him. Even Lord West said this, uh, Admiral West in the Parliament. There was no reason that Assad would use chemical weapons. He's winning military. So either it didn't happen, or it could have been done by the jihadists to trigger that response. So um, I've been very critical of the British government and, uh, and waging that battle at the moment. But I've got a lot of people on side. I've got three former British ambassadors to Syria on side who wrote to the Times saying British foreign policy is wrong with commitment to forced regime change. Because if you talk to people out there, whatever, you know, Christians, Muslims, whoever, um, and of course they are majority Muslim, lovely, lovely, gracious people, um, they're terrified of forced regime change because there is no moderate armed opposition there. So it just become another Iraq, another Libya. They don't want that. Women in particular don't want it because actually women have legal rights in Syria, probably the best in the Middle East. So, I know it's not Israel Palestine, but it's, no, but it's a bigger picture of, of you know, challenging authorities and challenging governments, and it can be painful. And I think for me, I'll just give you one other example. I call it the double twist of the knife. Because you come out from seeing the suffering, and you're there, you're alongside the people, and you can't help but you know, feel anguish. And then you come back to our own government sometimes, that it seems to me to be doing the wrong thing. And I came out of Nagorno-Karabakh, that place you've never heard of, that little enclave. 
and during the height of the war, and had photos of kids who were shredded by cluster bombs. So I went to see the then Minister of State of that part of the world for these photographs. I said, Minister, um, you know, Spanish is dropping cluster bombs on children. That's against all international conventions. Will the British government make representations uh, to the government of Azerbaijan to stop dropping cluster bombs on civilians and children? The answer I got, now this is in Hansard, so I'm not, you know, I'm not breaching any confidence at the moment. I don't mention the minister's name, which is a senior person at one of us. But um, the answer I got was horrifically brusque. It's just, no country has an interest in other countries, only interests. We have oil interests in Azerbaijan. Good morning. That's a twist of the knife. You know, you've come from somewhere where you've seen kids shred by cluster bombs, you've seen the suffering, and you get the British government to try and use its influence to you know, curtail that, and interests take over. And that's one of the most painful things. And I'm sure it's part of the bigger context of the Israel-Palestine situation. It's part of the bigger context of Syria, the proxy wars that are being fought um, in Syria. And, and that would be, makes them doubly depressed. Is that tangential? That's very good. <laughs> I know it's tangential. We're, we're not working in Israel-Palestine. I don't talk about places I don't work in. Yeah. Because I like to speak with authenticity. But I think it's a bigger picture. Yeah. Any further questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Roger Shelby Davis and Cuthbert Society. Um, do you think that there is a space where humanitarian intervention and military intervention by government can function together? Or do you think that actually, or many cases, actually military intervention from government isn't useful for humanitarian goals? Good question again. Um, I think it can function together. I think um, it should function together. Um, too often we see it doing the opposite, as I said, a missile attack in Syria. Um, or at the moment we're having, the British government is having quite a love affair with a regime in Khartoum. That's not military intervention, but there has been a lot of resources given to probably being used for military resources by Khartoum. Um, so it can often counterproductive. But I think if it really was used to uh, help in a just war, I believe there is such things as a just war, and help with a humanitarian um, aid, facilitating humanitarian aid in a just war, then I think it can help. So the answer is yes, it certainly can help, but so often we see it being abused, sadly. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I think the British Army is doing what it can. I'm probably not at active military but um, activity, but military support uh, for in South Sudan or you know, some of the people there who are trying to maintain the peace in South Sudan. So there are places where it can, certainly. Make sense? So I really assume we're sort of studying at the moment um, North East Africa and um, the role of sort of NGOs, um, particularly focusing a lot on the work of um, Alex Laval, and he's quite critical of uh, NGOs getting involved specifically because they tend to, you know, go for governments and then uphold uh, totalitarian sort of states. Um, and you've mentioned that your sort of organisation tends to not go through governments and go through more local organisations. Do you think that's the way that sort of humanitarian aid should be going? And I'd be sort of critical of you and Yeah, I, mean, I would love um, the, that sort of aid paradigm to move much more towards working with and through local partners. I mean, I'm just passionate about that um, because well, for a number of reasons. One is you maintain people's dignity. You say you ask them their priorities. So you respect their knowledge, their own communities, and then they have the ownership of it. Secondly, uh, it's facilitating, it's a helping hand, not a handout. And so much you know, humanitarian aid can just be you know, maintaining a dependency situation instead of using the resourcefulness and the resilience, which is phenomenal, of local people who want to do their own thing. Thirdly, work through local partners, it doesn't upset the local economy. Very often, when the big, big NGOs go in, the UN, um, they will completely destroy local farmers at assistance level because they change the whole economy. And I must say, oh, I can't remember where I was not so long ago. I was in, for some reason, I wasn't staying there. I visited the best hotel in town, and it had about, it's not expensive, it had 30 of these huge great UN white vehicles there that everybody just now sits on, in the top hotels in town. You know, but the local, local people, very often, you know, it does upset the local economy, it can do. Secondly, or third, fourthly, it can upset the local authority relationships. You know, they go in and they say, you do this, you, as it was impose this, and it may not be what people want. But when you say what's your priority, and when you use the local partners, then you celebrate their achievements. You know, it's their achievement. 
not ours, not imposed, it's achieved. And then when you celebrate their achievements, then that is the real basis for sustainability and you know, long-term development. So I would love to see the aid paradigm maybe genuinely to work in the contributory partners. And no matter where we work, we don't see the sort of wide difference of ineffective aid uh, of a big aid organisation. I have seen it sometimes. When I was in South Sudan, Pakistan, before we were working down south in Ye, and uh, the local guy there, our partner's a bishop, I said, what's your priority, bishop? He <laughs> said, uh, this woman's heart was very, very small. You know, we were in two weeks and a half at that time. Didn't have much money. Since then, I mean, we, we did our sums there. We've given away four and a half million pounds, which is quite good for small NGO. But anyway, in those days, didn't have very much. And I met the bishop from Ye, which is absolutely ravaged by war. And I said, bishop, you know, what are your priorities? He said, everything. But if I've only got 2,000 pounds, that any used to you. He said, it'd be transformational. So anyhow, I gave him 2,000 pounds, very embarrassed. And um, he, he, he used it when he had so many needs. He had an orphanage with massive orphans, uh, health clinics, they desperately needed medicines, they needed food, you name it, they needed it. Women's empowerment. Anyhow, £2,000 he spent on buying vegetables and sorghum, you know, the, the African crops, and sorghum grows tall, and South Sudanese are very tall. I was there, I telegraph pose with smiles on the top. You know, they're tall, tall. You know, all the summer he sent photographs of himself with the sorghum getting higher above him. <laughs> anyway, and the vegetables. He said, with the £2,000 you gave me, I was able to get one food the orphanage. We had surplus, so I could sell it in the market. Then we had some more surplus, which I gave to women's, or some surplus money box in the market, to give to a women's empowerment programme. They had a wonderful crop of sunflowers, and then they gave the sunflower seeds to um, mine injury victims, who used it to make soap, and the oil from the sunflower seeds. And they were just having a contract for sign for selling the soap. He said the money that we got from the soap, from the mining predicting, which it helps them, or from the women, went to pay the hearts it comes, but we'd never have had that money if we'd not given you money in the first place for what we did give it to them for. And that's an incredible ripple effect. But the orphanage which we were supporting, there's a clinic there, a lovely nurse called Jocelyn. And she was very, you know, she's wonderful, but very overstretched. Three miles up the road is a beautiful brick building built, I think, by UNICEF, by one of the UN organizations, completely empty. They didn't furnish it, they didn't staff it. There was just a total, well, a white elephant, red elephant. But you know, unless you work through the local people and you do actually engage them and give them the dignity of ownership and the dignity of celebration of their achievements, you get white elephants and what a waste of money. If anyone's interested in the aid world, I don't know if you are, there's a very challenging book. I know the guy who wrote it, he came once to an independent border. Um, clever title, it's something like this, and near enough for you to get it. It's called AIDS Clever Title. Aiding and abetting the great 0.7% deception. And it's not a journalistic book. I mean, it's very well referenced. It's academic in the sense that everything's well referenced and well written. But it'll make you really disturbed at the huge abuse of you know, taxpayers' money. Um, <coughs> just aiding and abetting the people. Going into people's pockets, going into government's pockets, never reaching people, or being given to people and then being sold in the market for money which people can't afford as money making. I mean, it's very well documented and it's very scary. So, I mean, I love the way hard works. Unless we do have brilliant interns, and the interns, um, we love having them and they always sat to with us, but they always said we want to change the aid paradigm. Now, the exceptions to that are the big disasters. When you have a tsunami or an earthquake, then you need big teams. You need the surgical teams, you need the engineers, obviously. But for this kind of development, honour people and use their resources, their knowledge, their resilience. I think it's wonderful. You know, I'll leave um, some of our newsletters here and have a look and to see. Um, so I think that'll give you a bit more of an idea. But I hope I'll leave it paint some verbal pictures. Any other questions or comments? Any really challenging? Yes. <laughs> Charles Cowell, Van, Van Norbert College, rather. Um, what should be done to galvanise the international community and prevent this sort of thing being ignored as it so often is? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that's where, what I like about the double um, focus of heart, the aid and the advocacy. You see, I was a founder trustee of Merlin, which is like the British Medicine Sans Frontier. Not a very good aid, but it was all just put down there and then and wasn't really publicised or wasn't used to challenge governments. Um, when you do aid and advocacy, you can then go and talk about what you've done and try and galvanise the international community. For example, January this year, not three months ago, we crossed the border illegally into Sudan again, into Blue Nile State, 
next door to me, Mountain Sport. And it's hot. <coughs> and this has got the you know, trash and civil war going on there. And we just came across in a tiny little town called Wadaka. Um, I, think, I think there's 9,000. Again, I, I, the pictures I can show you. It'll be referred to in here, anyway. Um, and uh, they had to flee the civil war. And they just had to run. And some of them actually lost their families as they ran. And it was heartbreak, heartbreak ran. And no other NGOs had been anywhere near them. They were, they were dying. They were scavenging for roots. They were boiling leaves in the nutritional value just to stop the pangs of hunger. Uh, but they died. And so the park came back, and we, I said, we're very small, but we managed to raise 50,000 pounds, and we managed to get that out to them. And um, it is you know, all credit to the local people of the logistics are doing that. It may not sound very much, but 26 pounds will actually buy enough food for a family of six for three months. So it will actually save a lot of lives. But then we could also then sort of try and challenge the governments to be available for those kinds of situations. We've got the evidence. No people are dying. Where are the aid organisations? And I do challenge British government. And DFID has actually changed its policy for quite a one of the big aid organisations is very often they are inaccessible. You know, to ordinary people, but because they don't reach the ordinary people. But DFID has recently changed its policy. It did go through a stage where it would only work through the big NGOs because they said they didn't have the resources to, um, you know, monitor small NGOs. They've just diversified and they are now making funds available for small NGOs such as Heart. So hopefully we can at least continue. And maybe that's partly because I banged on at length in, in Parliament about the fact that people like you are not reached. Um, someone that my partner in lovely town, Neville, wow, wow, in the Bar of Gazelle in Sudan, South Sudan. I mean, he sent Heart two or three SOSs where he's had Lots of them are fleeing the civil war, some of them in the mountains, and then some of the civil war in South Sudan. And this time a year ago, he had 5,000 fled into his cathedral compound. And there were photographs there, just you know, 5,000 people just fled into the compound. He had nothing. So he sent Hart an SOS, and he said, Please will Hart do what Hart always does? Please will you send us emergency funds? I've had to go and borrow money from the traders, and I need to get some money before I get arrested. So again, it sounds little, but it goes a long way. I said, Bishop, I mean, really, sort of, no, it says 10,000. He said, that's wonderful. That's, that'll buy lots and lots of sorghum, which indeed it does. But then I went to see him, and I said, but I'll try his occupation now. Um, have you ever thought of applying to DFID? And he just rolled his eyes at me. He said, give me a break. He said, for the big aid organisations, by the time they come, they do their assessments, and they've assessed their assessments. People have died. Who gives it to them? And I've challenged ministers on this. And I think they, you know, it is. I understand accountability, I understand being responsible for taxpayers' money. Of course, you, you've got to be careful where the money goes, it's taxpayers' money. But on the other hand, you've got to have some kind of flexibility. And the other thing is, which I would like to see a change, is the kind of user-unfriendly means of accountability for people like them in um, That lovely bishop who gave all that money for women's empowerment programme and to mind injury victims and so on, uh, and that, uh, just after that, and it had these wonderful reports and photographs, and you met the ladies and you'd see what they'd done, and fantastic. I said, Bishop, there's one problem. We do need some accounts. You know, you've got the treasurer, you've got the charity mission. And, that, and this great tall guy, he just almost crumbled, he almost broke down in tears. He said, But I don't know what to do with this spreadsheet. Why should we? You know, why should we? Important the SPLA, the Bishop is doing this huge amount of work. And one of the things I think I would like to see shifted again is a much more sensitive and flexible means of accountability for people who are on the receiving end, particularly in remote places or, you know, in better commas, unsophisticated places. So that is the kind of things which we're working on. But we do have some quite constructive discussions, some of the time, and we do see some changes, but there's a lot of work to be done. So just to answer the question, what we can do, because we do aid and advocacy, is we can go and get the evidence of the need to say, I was there, being I've seen this as I've seen the photographs. Um, and then we can speak about it in the parliament. And we have had quite a success. There was a huge famine in Shin State some years back. We did get £650,000 from the for that. Because we were there. We had photographs. So you challenge, you call to account, and you name that it needs to be shown. And there has to be some response. But that's why it's important to do the aid and advocacy. Make sense? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Please. Thank you. I'm just so impressed that you're all here with exams. <laughs> <laughs>
just remember you say I'm fresh with a difference and you can manage this. <laughs> Fantastic. No one's got any further points. Um, one final round of applause for the fans. I'm actually giving you the applause for being here. Thank you so much for having me. If you ever invite me again, I will remember my PowerPoint. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever turned up loud at the last few instances. It must have fallen out the way. Anyway, thank you for having me. Privileged to be here. Very thought-provoking and good questions. I hope I've put in some sense and shared some of the pain and passion. Thank you so much. I should go away with a big smile. <laughs> and I do. I will leave these for you. Do take these if you're interested in them. And I will donate this book. Thank you. Yeah, in slavery. If anyone's interested in slavery. Anyone doing special pieces on slavery or trafficking? No. I can't leave one. Let's give one. Yes. No. Thank, thank you. Yeah, of Tonight, uh, we've obviously got our, our reading. Some of you have uh, asked some questions, um, but since the numbers tonight are so low, I'm pleased to invite everyone back if you want to, to come back to the room, enjoy some of our wine, maybe to take some of the points we discussed further. Um, and having said that, uh, we have one more event this week, and one more event in pre exams, uh, which is our debate tomorrow night. This house believes the Good Friday Agreement is under threat. We have eight speakers coming including uh, Keith Archibald, the Sinn Féin's um, higher education and further education spokesperson, and the MLA Free Sterry. We have uh, Jamie Bryson, the notorious blogger, uh, loyalist unionist activist. Uh, we have Professor Peter Sherlow, who's a, a supporter of the United Ireland Mo Movement and the Director of Irish Studies at the University of Liverpool. Uh, and we also have a couple of academics from Durham University. Um, anyone who does job for Durham will come Finished off with the um, Dr. Claire Pearson from the University of Liverpool and uh, the Northern Ireland political editor of the Iron newspaper, Sam McBride. So uh, it's a big panel. Uh, and I know obviously it's exams around and the corner, and I'm so grateful for even the 25, 20 of you turning out tonight. It's been a busy week. It's been a busy week, and I, I know it's, it's, it's great to see so many of you here. Um, tell your friends about those empty tickets for the ball, um, but if not, you're more than welcome to come back to the evening. Thank you very much. I have all the things. Thank you.